Father God, we come into this place as your children. We come into this place this morning, whoa, after dealing with 18 months that none of us could have anticipated, none of us could have expected, none of us ever would have wished for, but God, you reign supreme. And God, we come into this place and we worship the name that is above every other name. We come into this place and we worship the name of Jesus, the name that every knee will bow before one day, that every tongue, every tribe in the world will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And so, Father God, I pray that you would just send your spirit among us today, that you would bless us as we gather together in person and online. God, I pray that you would bless your church here in the city of Ottawa and across our nation and around the world for your glory and for your fame, not for ours, but for yours. And that we would bring hope to the hopeless, that we would bring light into places of darkness, and that we would truly, as a family of believers, see the captives set free. So God, I praise you again and thank you for this time. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may grab a seat. It is so good to see your eyes this morning (laughs) and to see how tall all your children got over the last 18 months. I don't know why, but that made me feel really old to see your kids coming up to my shoulders when the last time I saw them, they were down here. So it's great to have each and every one of you uh, back here this morning and a huge shout out to our Greenbelt family online that is joining us at Greenbelt Online. Uh, Just a couple of quick announcements before I dive into today's message. Um, As you saw, Everything looks very different, how we do church, how we get you checked in, how we're asking you to sit and all of these things. We understand and we know that this is not an ideal situation. We're basically dealing with, you know, trying to do ministry in a way that's not ideal, dealing with a situation that's not ideal. So again, I thank you so much for your patience. I thank you so much for your graces. I thank you so much for your prayer. And, you know, and if there's little things that we can do to tweak to make the experience, you know, smoother and work a little better, please don't hesitate to drop us an email. You can send that to office at greenbelt.church and we will get your feedback, your positive, constructive feedback, (laughs) your positive and constructive feedback so that we can move ministry forward as a church family. We welcome that. Um, And also at, uh, after our 11 o'clock service, we are having a big party outside. We are having our regather party. There is free pizza. Free pizza always gets me to an event. So that we're excited about that. We got activities for the kids, you know, and so please uh, come back after the second service for our big regather party that is happening outside. And man, praising God for the incredibly beautiful day to put this on today. If you have a Bible with you this morning, I would encourage you to open up to the book of Acts. If you don't know where that is, it's in the New Testament. It's kind of right after the four books of the Bible that we call the Gospels. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John describe for us the ministry, the life, the miracles, the death, the resurrection, and the ascension. That's the return to heaven of Jesus. And then right after that, we have what's called the book of Acts. And that is what we are going to be looking at. We're going to be going through this book for the remainder of the fall, right up until the Christmas season. And uh, again, (laughs) I'm really nervous because I've been preaching to an empty room for the past 18 months. So the fact that there's people looking at me right now, it's like I'm sweating a little bit. I'm a little uncomfortable. So if you notice these big pit stains, okay, uh, don't send me an email about that because that's just a given. Um, But again, there's this spiritual thing that I believe happens when we proclaim the word of God. I was sharing this with our worship team before we got started this morning. Is I heard a preacher once say this, regardless of the number of people in the room, 
When we as a church lift up and proclaim the name of Jesus out loud, something is listening. You see, we believe as a church that our battle is not against people. You know, when we see people who are living out in our culture and out in our society who live very different lives than we live as Christians, who believe very different things than you and I believe as Christians, when people have different ideologies, when people have different political affiliations, when people have different lifestyles than us as Bible-believing, spirit-filled followers of Jesus, we don't look at those people as the enemy. They are not the enemy. They're the prize. They're the reason why the church exists. So that you and I could be built up, encouraged, deal with the own sin in our own lives, and then be a blessing to a world that desperately needs to know about the love of God. That desperately needs to know that there is hope for their problems. There's a solution for their desires. They are not the enemy. They're the prize. And so as we kick off, man, our 50th year of ministry as a church family, that's what I want us to talk about over the next several months. And that's why we're going to be looking at the book of Acts. Because the book of Acts is a blueprint of what it means to live as, again, spirit-filled followers of Jesus in a very complicated, hostile, messy world. You know, throughout my 15 years of pastoring, um, I, I, I have the privilege of coming alongside a lot of different people when they're going through different things in their life. And so often, one of the big questions I get when people come and see me, whether it's for discipleship, pastoral care, spiritual advice, things like that, a lot of the times the questions that people ask me is something like this. It's how am I supposed to live out my faith in this world? How am I supposed to live out my Christian faith in my place of work? How am I supposed to live out my Christian faith in my school? How am I supposed to live out my Christian faith as I deal with crisis? How am I supposed to live out my Christian faith as I deal with the unknown? How am I supposed to live out this faith in difficulties, in family problems that we're going through? How am I supposed to, as a Christian, respond to criticism? personal attack, or even flat out persecution. What am I supposed to do with this? <laughs> right? How do I deal with, as, as I'm living in a culture that feels like it's becoming more and more hostile to my fundamental beliefs? <laughs> How am I supposed to respond to this? And one of the big questions I get too is, and Pastor Kevin, and as a Christian, I know you want me to share my faith with people around me. I know you want me to share my faith with people at work and people at school and in my family. But where do I even begin? (laughs) Because the chasm between where I am in my faith and where they are in their worldview seems insurmountable. It seems impossible (laughs) to bring Jesus to those people. That's why I love pastoring. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> to be honest, when I hear these kind of questions and I hear these struggles that none of us are immune from, we all have these from time to time. And when people come to me and say, Pastor Kevin, what should I do? Well, again, my answer is always, what does the Bible say? <laughs> now, the Bible didn't give us a verse for dealing with COVID-19. <laughs> the Bible didn't give us a verse for dealing with vaccinations or not. It doesn't give us a verse for which political party to vote for tomorrow, all of these things, but it does give us guidelines. It does give us principles. It, and it ultimately what it does is it peels back our hearts. It peels back our minds, our attitudes, so that you and I can, if we're going to let the Holy Spirit actually work in our minds, work in our hearts, 
to actually transform our mind, to actually transform our hearts and to equip us and strengthen us to accomplish everything that God wants us to accomplish. So my hope and my desire for the next few months as a church family, as we go through the book of Acts, is that this book will encourage you in your faith. Regardless of where you're at in your faith, maybe you're joining us today or joining us at Greenbelt Online and you're still even just wrestling with who God is and who Jesus is and what does the resurrection mean and was it true and all of those things. And if you're still wrestling with those things, we think those are good things to wrestle with. I actually believe the church should be the safest place in the world to have doubt and to have questions because God wants to work through those in your life. And for those of you, maybe life is going amazing and the past 18 months has been the, mo the greatest blessing you've ever experienced in your life. Anyone can say that, that the past 18 months has just been the greatest 18 months of your life? Yeah, no hands are going up, okay? <laughs> 18 months was hard. It was not easy, right? But maybe things are going really good for you. Well, what is God calling you for? And to live out your faith as you're experiencing these blessings of God in your life. So that's why I want us to look at, and I called this sermon series, Church on the Go. We're going to look at what does it mean to be followers of Jesus on the go. Now, the book of Acts, if you're not familiar with it, if you're new to the Bible, it's a book that was written by a man named Luke. Now, Luke, we know, was a physician. He was a doctor. So he's very smart. He's very educated. He's a man who's used to doing research. And so what he did is he wrote two books that we find in the New Testament. He wrote the gospel that has his name on it, the gospel of Luke. And he wrote this to a guy named Theophilus. There's my lisp coming out again on the first day with everyone back in the room. That's okay. <laughs> and uh, he wrote this book to this man to affirm him, affirm to him everything that he has heard about Jesus. So his purpose for writing this down was so that the church could be encouraged in the message and the ministry of Jesus. And then he wrote this follow-up book. It's like the ultimate sequel. And uh, if you're a movie buff, it's actually a sequel that's good. <laughs> Most sequels in Hollywood are not very good. And there's a rare exception. But this one's a great sequel because it takes everything about the teachings of Jesus, his miracles, how, what he taught, what he commanded, all of these things, and then it puts some feet to it. It puts some hands to it. It puts some action to the teachings of Jesus so that you and I can go, what does it look like to be a church on the go? And so this book, again, it's this sequel. It's, and, um, and it's interesting on how, again, the purposes of why Luke wrote this, right? If I'm going to read here from Luke chapter 24, verses 46. So this is the end of the gospel of Luke. And this is Luke's heart. This is what he wants Christians. Make sure you get this. Because there's a lot of good things that you and I can do as followers of Jesus in the world. But if we miss this, we might be doing good things for no good reason, All right? Look at what Luke writes for us here in, uh, again, Luke chapter 24, verse 46 says, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day and repentance for the forgiveness of sin will be preached in his name to all the nations beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what my father has promised but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. So Jesus is starting to give marching orders to the church. He's saying, I am going to use you as my witnesses. And what a witness is, is it's someone who gives a legal account to something that happened. You see, the call of the Christian is to be a witness, not to be the judge or not to be the lawyer. The call of the Christian is to be the witness. 
that I am going to legally stand before the judge and proclaim what I saw. And he says, I'm going to send you. But then there's a little sidebar here in, in these verses here in verse 49. He says, I'm going to send you out into the world as my witnesses. But before I can do that, I have to send you something. In fact, I have to send you someone. I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. All equally God. One God, three persons. And so Jesus is saying, you're going to stay right. You're going to stay put. Don't, I know you're excited. I know you want to get out there. I know you want to do all this good stuff, but you're going to stay put until this power comes that you're going to need so that you can go. Right. And again, we see this theme again and again and again of going, of going and of being sent all throughout the gospels. John talks about it in his gospel. He mentions this in chapter 20, verses 21, where it says, as the father has sent me, I am sending you. Matthew records this as well in a very famous passage in his gospel that we call the great commission, where he says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go, make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. See, there's this language all throughout the Gospels of this sending, of this going. And then Luke continues that exact same theme right at the very beginning of Acts chapter one, where again, the words of Jesus say, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. You see, the book of Acts continues the mission of Jesus to make disciples of all the nations to go, <laughs> to go, <laughs> One of the things that I've learned over the past 18 months, as we've done church online, as we've had to do ministry in ways, again, I would never have planned for it. I never would have imagined it. But I personally have been incredibly blessed in watching the church have to go. Because there's something in our human nature that doesn't like to go. You see, staying put is easy. Staying put is comfortable. When church becomes too familiar, when church becomes kind of about the programming that I love and the traditions that I love and the ministries that I love, suddenly there's a shift and it's a subtle shift that can happen in our hearts where suddenly we see church and ministry more about what I get from it instead of engaging in the mission. And so because everything had to pivot and everything had to change rapidly and constantly <laughs> over the past 18 months. It was a little exhausting. I'll admit that. However, it forced us to check our hearts and to check, are we more in love with God's mission to seek and save the loss? Or, we, or are we more in love with the method of ministry. So I personally have been very blessed because I've seen so many of you having to step out and figure out ministry in a new way. How do I use my spiritual gifts in a way that I've never used them before? How do I reach people? How do I bless people? How do I use these gifts that God has given me for the building up of God's church? <laughs> And I think that's a great thing when we can do that, because I think what we're doing is we're actually responding to the language that we read in the Gospels and we see here at the beginning of the book of Acts. Because again, this language all throughout the Gospels and the book of Acts, right? It's very active language, right? It's not passive. It's very active. It's, it's not a let's just sit around 
and, and wait for Jesus to come back one day. <laughs> It's like, because we believe as Bible-believing Christians that Jesus is going to come back one day. All the problems of the world are going to be dealt with. All the problems, all the problems of the world will ultimately be dealt with one day when Jesus returns and sets up his earthly kingdom. And there'll be no more death and no more tears and no more sorrow and no more pain. (laughs) But that day is a day to come. And so we're not passive while we wait for that day. We're active. We go. We make disciples. We teach, we obey, and we are sent. Very active language, all built around God's mission. One of the things, again, I'm, we're going to get into Acts. This is the long introduction. <laughs> but in Matthew's gospel, when he gives the great commission, and the people see Jesus, and he tells them to go, He gives them these marching orders to go, make disciples. Well, the Bible here tells us that some doubted. Some doubted. Now, often when you and I hear the word doubted, what we think is, we think it's a doubt of faith. So people are seeing the resurrected Jesus and they're not believing in Jesus. You know, because it reads like in the English language, it reads like it's a doubt of faith. But if you read this and study this in the Greek, it's actually not a doubt of faith. It's a doubt of what am I supposed to do with this? I mean, we knew Jesus was Lord. We've been calling him Lord for a long time. We've been worshiping him as God. He died. He rose from the dead. And now he's telling me to go into all the nations. And most of these people have never left their town where they were born until Jesus came around. And I have to go into all the nations. Where are all the nations? I'm supposed to go to Rome. What do I do with that? I'm supposed to go to Samaria. What do I do with that? I'm supposed to go to Judea. What am I supposed to do with this? The Greek here is not a doubt of faith. It's a, it's hesitation and it's indecision. We hesitate and we don't know what to do. And that's why Jesus told his disciples to wait. And this is what I want to read for us today in Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 1. This is why Jesus wanted them first to wait. It wasn't wait until Jesus returns. It was wait until the Holy Spirit comes to you. So let's read this here from Acts chapter 2. And I'm going to start here in verse one. It says, when the day of Pentecost came, so Pentecost is a Jewish celebration when um, all the Jewish men had to go back to Jerusalem. And so, so all, uh, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together. So the, they are the disciples of Jesus. It's the apostles. It's the women that were part of Jesus's ministry. It's all the disciples who had followed him and kind of huddled back up together after the resurrection of Jesus. Then in verse two says, suddenly wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy spirit and they began to speak in other tongues as the spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem, God fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. And when they heard this sound, A crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? How then is it that each of us hears them in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya near Serene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans, Arabs. Here's all the nations. Again, because this celebration required all these Jewish people to come, people who were curious about the Jewish faith would come. People who converted to Judaism would come for this celebration of Passover. Suddenly all the nations have come to you and now they're hearing this in their native language. What is going on? 
Verse 12 says, amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? And then verse 13 is the typical throw people under the bus verse. Ah, they're drunk. (laughs) Drinking too much wine. That's what's going on. Try to downplay the miracle of God (laughs) in this moment. You see, there's a very big difference between the disciples of Matthew 28 and the, and the disciples of Acts chapter 2. You see, the disciples of Matthew 28, when they doubt, when they're kind of dealing with indecision, when they're kind of dealing with, I, I don't know how I'm supposed to respond to this, the disciple of Matthew chapter, eight, uh, chapter 28, very different than the disciple of Acts chapter 2. And what's the difference? The Holy Spirit. See, I think too often we as Christians compare ourselves to the disciples of Acts chapter 28, uh, of Matthew 28. And I think we need to stop doing that. We need to stop comparing ourselves to the disciples of Matthew 28. And we need to look at the life and the ministry of the disciples after Acts chapter 2. Because if you have put your faith in Jesus to save you from your sin, the Bible says you have received this exact same Holy Spirit that showed up on the day of Pentecost. That this power that God gave to his apostles and to his disciples way back here in the city of Jerusalem is the exact same power that you and I received when we put our faith in Jesus. You see, the big idea that I want you to remember today is this. You have the power to go and make disciples. You have the power to go and make disciples. The trick is, in our flesh, in our human nature, as we're dealing with sin being cleaned up in our lives, we still deal with indecision and we still do with hesitancy. (laughs) So what I want us to do is kind of look at this um, text here from Acts chapter 2 in such a way that kind of encourages you, one, to believe that you have this power in you, and two, to encourage you, maybe you haven't been feeling it as much over the past 18 months. Maybe you've felt stuck. Maybe you're kind of trying to figure out, well, I I, I know the Bible tells me I have this, but I'm not feeling it. So what do I do in those instances? Right? So two things that I want us to talk about in the remainder of our time together this morning, and I'd encourage you to uh, jot these down so you can talk about them in your life group this week. Uh, The first thing, if you want to overcome hesitancy and indecision in your Christian faith, I've come to believe the first thing that you and I need to do is to go where Jesus tells you to go. See, this one sounds so simple, but I think this is where you and I hesitate the most and where you and I make up excuses why we shouldn't do the things that Jesus tells us to do or to go to the places that Jesus tells us to go. I mean, the first command that Jesus gives to the disciples is to stay put, So there is a season sometimes in our life where you do need to stay put so that you can be built up and encouraged. They were told to stay put because the Holy Spirit is going to come on you at that point. Then you're going to receive this power. And then you can now do all the other things I've commanded you, like love your neighbor. (laughs) Question I get a lot from people is, well, Pastor Kevin, um, but I don't like my neighbor. (laughs) And I'm supposed to love them. Is there an exception? I love when Christians look for the exceptions. <laughs> uh, there's none. That doesn't mean you need to be best friends. Doesn't mean you have to invite them over and play board games with them. 
but are you responding in love? It's commandment number one from Jesus. Love your neighbors. If you don't even know them, don't like them, <laughs> well, then we're kind of surprised. Why does Jesus feel far? Because <laughs> we're not listening to the very first thing he told us to do. Second thing he told us to do was, well, go and get baptized. And we make up excuses of why not to get baptized. Well, I don't want to get baptized because I don't want to get in the hot tub and I don't want to stand in front of people. I'm embarrassed. Uh, I don't want to give a speech. And, and we make up all these excuses for not doing the second thing that Jesus told us to do, the place he told us to go. And again, then we're surprised that Jesus feels far and we feel like there's not a lot of power. You see, we have to disciple ourselves to actually go to the places Jesus tells us to go to. Right before the pandemic kicked in, the fall before the pandemic, I went on two missions trips in late 2019. And for those, who, those of you who know me personally, like know me really well, know <laughs> I hate traveling. I, I am terrified of flying. I, I, I have a generalized anxiety issue. The, as soon as I get into the airport, my intestines all start twisting up. I feel like I'm going to throw up. I have a hard time breathing. It feels like there's someone standing on my chest. I found this great way to finally deal with it. It's drugs and prayer. So those two things combined have helped me get onto airplanes. Okay. But I don't like to travel. I'm very nervous flying. I, I'm very very nervous being in places where I don't know the language. It's just a thing that I have. Um, I like to be home. <laughs> I like my lazy boy. I like my large screen TV. I like my pulpit where there's a nice space. I know everyone understands my language. If my car breaks down, I'm going to be okay. I can suffer from loving comfort. But I knew God was telling me to go. But, and I could have made up every excuse in the book not to go. I could have easily gotten a doctor's note not to go because of the anxiety that I get and that feeling of someone standing on my chest when my anxiety gets too high. I could easily get a note to get out of anything. But when God tells you to go, I'm speaking from experience. You will experience the presence of God in a way that you have never experienced it before when you actually go to the place he wants you to be at. Because he's got something for you to do there. And when I went to Beirut, for example, I had no clue what I was supposed to do there. I had no clue. I was like, and they were like, well, it was just like, well, just do as the Lord leads you. And it's like, no. And, and honestly, I don't like it when Christian leaders tell me that. I'm like, no, just tell me what to do because I just want to serve. It's just easier for me to just, you're the boss here. You're the leader here. You're the pastor here. Just tell me what to do. And I literally just felt I was just supposed to bring a notepad and pencils. And I don't know why. And I brought it. And then I got to this place and there were hundreds and hundreds of kids and I love kids ministry. I think kids ministry is one of the most important things we do as the church. And I pray for and I bless our kids own leaders. And I'm so glad they're doing it. And that I'm down here with all of you. <laughs> kids are not my natural thing. And here I am in a country where I don't speak the language. And I don't like the food and all of these things. <laughs> and I'm surrounded by hundreds of kids and I'm drawing Batman and Spider-Man pictures for them sitting on the ground, completely surrounded by them, drawing picture after picture after picture and just watching the smiles and watching the smiles and watching the smiles and then watching them go over there and people praying with them and watching these kids come in to know who Jesus is. You don't know what God wants to do. You have no clue what God will do when we can stop hesitating, stop being indecisive when God calls us to go somewhere. Right? And this is what we see here in Acts chapter 2. I'm going to read here in uh, chapter 2, verses uh, 22. So this is Peter. 
Again, stop comparing yourself to Peter who denies Jesus. Stop comparing yourself to Jesus who, uh, sorry, to Peter who sinks when he steps out of the boat. Compare yourself to Peter of Acts chapter two because you have the same power that Peter has where he preaches. It says, fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him. As you yourselves know, this man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep hold on him. And then let me jump down to verse 36. So Peter is preaching here this message of Jesus, of died, resurrected, ascended back to heaven. And it continues verse 36. Therefore, let all of Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. And when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall I do? And Peter replied, repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sin. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then it says 3,000 people were baptized, uh, became believers that day. Go where Jesus calls you to go. Don't compare yourself to Peter of Matthew 28. Compare yourself to Peter of Acts chapter 2 because you have power to go and make disciples. So that's the first thing. Go where Jesus tells you to go. And then the second point that I want to conclude with is this. Proclaim Jesus above all else. Proclaim Jesus above all else. Be before I became a pastor, I used to work in the computer industry. I was a computer consultant for nearly 14 years. And when I made the decision to quit that job, to leave that career and go into full-time pastoral ministry, again, that was one of those anxiety moments. And I was like, oh, I can't believe I did this. And woke, woke up a few nights in a panic sweat <laughs> of what did I do? I just ruined my future. I just destroyed my family's livelihood and all of these things. Um, but one of the greatest fears that I actually had in that moment was this. Would the people that I worked with be surprised that I was even a Jesus follower? When they found out why I was resigning to become a pastor in an evangelical church, would that have been so shocking to them because there was no evidence of me even being a Jesus follower in the workplace? That honestly was my greatest fear. Proclaim Jesus above all else. Again, there are lots of great things that as followers of Jesus, you and I do in the world. I firmly believe in volunteering out in the community with different organizations. I firmly believe in the importance of being a part and active in the electoral process. I firmly believe in all of these things that we have as a nation when it comes to our rights and our freedoms. These are all good things. But do you proclaim those things more than Jesus? See, there's a challenge there. And I've been challenged myself over the past 18 months on that. What am I known for at the end of the day? You see, I want to be known as what Peter describes here. As someone who has been given the power to go. Not just to do all these good things in the world, but to ensure that we're proclaiming Jesus in a way that actually attracts people to Jesus. Because you and I know there's two ways we can proclaim Jesus. <laughs> there's a way we can proclaim him that'll make it so that nobody, nobody wants to come to your church. 
And nobody wants to come to your home and have to listen to you gramble on these Bible verses ever again. Or there's a way by the spirit of God working in you and through you where the fruit of the spirit of gentleness, patience, self-control, joy, love, humility, all of these things, we can still proclaim Jesus in truth, but from a radically different posture, which actually draws people to Jesus instead of going, uh, no, thank you. <laughs> I don't want anything to do with that. <laughs> right? Are we proclaiming Jesus first? You see, because Jesus said these words in the Gospels. He said, seek first the kingdom of God, and then all these things will be given to you. <laughs> you see, when the disciples were worried about their careers, worried about their money, worried about their clothing, worried about all these earthly things, Jesus said, there's nothing wrong with those things. Those are all good things. But seek first my kingdom, <laughs> Seek first my plans, my desires, my mission. Put that first, and then everything else will fall into place. Everything else will get taken care of. Modern day Western Christianity, we kind of flipped it a little bit. As my life is so busy pursuing things of the world, well, I'll volunteer at the church and I'll volunteer in the mission of the church if there's time left over. Or I'll donate financially if there's money left over. Or I'll <laughs> try to obey these teachings of Jesus and live out this spirit-filled life if I can accommodate it. Jesus asks us to flip that. To seek first his kingdom and his mission and his priority. And then the rest will fall into place. The rest will take care of itself. You know, so when it comes to what is even the mission of Jesus, what does Jesus want from the church? The Bible's so clear on it. And we're going to explore this all throughout this series, caring for other people, putting other people's desires, guess what? Above my own. That's a basic thing of the Christian faith. Thinking of other people as better than yourself. Even that politician I hate. Yeah, guess what? Even the politician you hate. <laughs> All of these things, care for the sick, care for the widow, care for the orphan, reach the marginalized, love on the alien, welcome the stranger. It's a simple message, but we go, eh, we hesitate. Oh, I'm indecisive. But you and I need to remember you have the power to go and make disciples. So if you find yourself hesitant, if you find yourself indecisive, I would challenge you this morning. Are you going to the places where Jesus calls you to go? What has Jesus asked you to do? Whether through your prayer and you've just had that sense, you know Jesus is calling you to something and you've just not done it. What have you seen in the clear teachings of the Bible that you've said, hey, yeah, I'm just going to cut that page out, rip that page out, ignore that verse. I'm not doing that. What are you not doing that Jesus is calling you to do? And ask him this week. Talk about it in your life group this week. Hold me accountable to do these things more so I can actually go where Jesus is calling me to go. And then second, ask yourself, am I proclaiming Jesus above all else? Am I, and, and am I proclaiming him in a way that's actually drawing people to Jesus? Or am I pushing people away from Jesus? You see, that's the message here. This is where the power of Jesus, the power of the Holy Spirit in your life is so crucial, right? And this is what I love about P Peter's sermon here in Acts chapter two, when he says, this is really simple <laughs> for anyone in the world, for anyone, regardless of what they believe, regardless of how they live, regardless of the choices that they've made in their lives, there is a God who loves you. And you can know him, not by being religious and keeping all these rules and keeping all these traditions, but by simply repenting. And what the word repent means, it means it sees this sin over here that I love. Well, I'm going to turn my heart away from that. And I'm going to turn my heart back to God. <laughs> and I'm going to say, God, forgive me, a sinner. <laughs> Come into my life. <laughs> Make me new. <laughs> 
And that's all it takes. And if you do that at Greenbelt Online, a little pop-up shows up and you can click that button and you can let us know that you've prayed that simple prayer today. We want to rejoice with you. If you pray that way this morning here in, our, in this room, man, please come see me after the service. Let me know that you prayed this. I want to celebrate and rejoice with you because God wants to give each of us this power to go into the world that God's called us to impact. And I firmly believe you will be incredibly blessed when you trust God's power in your life. Let's pray together. Lord God, again, we praise you and thank you that we can come to this place. Thank you that we can worship you both online and in person. Father, I thank you for um, all the ways that you have built up our church family to go over the last 18 months. God, I praise you for the 123 people who've accepted Jesus through this ministry at Greenbelt Church over the past 18 months. God, I thank you for the sacrifice that the church has made for your mission. And God, I praise you for how you've been living and moving in our lives. Heavenly Father, I ask that you would bless this year ahead that we're stepping into as a church family. You have blessed this church with 49 years of ministry. And God, I, my hope, my desire is that this year we would see more fruit than we've ever seen before. People set freed from their sin, marriages restored, hearts healed, people under oppression set free. And that God, that you would truly do immeasurably more than we could ask or imagine because of your power at work in our lives. And I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.